الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فخلف من بعدهم خلف أضاعوا الصلاة واتبعوا الشهوات فسوف يلقون غيا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل صالحا فأولئك يدخلون الجنة ولا يظلمون شيئا اللهم اجعلنا منهم رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين uh, First of all I'd like to express how happy I am that I got a chance to come out here I don't travel nearly as much as I used to before and it's been some time since I've been uh, with this community and I hope you're doing well and inshallah ta'ala I hope that you remember myself and the Muslim community in Dallas uh, in your prayers and I remember you inshallah ta'ala I promise you that I remember you as I travel back with my wife inshallah ta'ala tomorrow. In the brief uh, session that I have with you today the, the question or the title that was given to me is actually quite difficult uh, and about guidance in youthful years or attaining guidance in youthful years. So the first thing I'd like to give you is something that I've actually talked about a number of times on a number of different occasions and that's just some comments about guidance itself that every Muslim should be clear on some fundamental starting points and the first of them is that human beings we have a tendency to have reassurance we want to we want to be sure about something we don't like risks we want to make sure that we're protected in the future you know if you're for example making a move you want to ask a hundred questions before you make the move if you're considering a job, you ask a lot before you consider a job, things like that, right? Or if you're investing your money, then you consider a lot of factors before you, you, know, you invest your money. Uh, especially when it comes to our children, we're, we're going to put our kids in a school. We do a lot of investigating before we put our children in a school. But at the end of the day, the reality is that Allah Azza wa Jal did not give us assurances in this life of the, of the future in this life at all. We have to do the best we can. And at the end of the day, every step we take is an act of tawakkul in Allah. It is an act of reliance in Allah. Because you can have the best plan in the world and things will not work out anywhere near what you thought. And you can have no plan at all and everything will get straightened out. That can happen and it certainly does happen. So you have many instances in the Quran, in the prophetic narrative as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where things are not they don't look like they're going to work out at all. Like Musa alayhi salam being thrown in a basket. That doesn't look like much of a plan. But that is actually the means by which an empire is destroyed. You know, the, the, the empire of Fir'aun and the oppression of Fir'aun against countless people came to an end because a baby was thrown in a basket. So Allah has his own way of making things work out. On the negative side also, there are people, for example, people ask all the time, people are worried about their kids, and I know there are some young people in the audience, but, and I'm going to try to balance this conversation between parents and, and the youth, inshallah ta'ala. Parents are constantly concerned, how do I give my children a proper education? I want to make sure they're good Muslims. I want to make sure that I don't have to worry about their deen, things like that. And you hear enough horror stories and enough lectures to be terrified of this scenario. You know, and then, then there are people you know, oh, I don't want my kids to be like, you know, Zubair Sahab's children, that's really, you know, like, so there's enough of those conversations you have over Eid and, you know, it's, it's great. But the, the thing I want to share with you is on the one hand you have, you know, situations where children are raised with the best of character without even a parental figure, like the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Right, he's kidnapped as a child, so there is no father or mother figure really for him to look up to. So the remnants and the memory of a father to giving him certain lessons when he was a kid are the ones that, are, that he's holding on to even in his teenage years. Can you imagine the last Islamic lesson he received? The last dars he received, the last bit of advice he received when he was a kid is now coming back and he's utilizing it when he's in a closed room with a woman trying to seduce him. And he remembers that lesson. So. You know, and it's not like he's receiving a regular Islamic education. <laughs> That's not the case. That's certainly not the case. Because the story reveals that, you know, the one that was raising him, the Aziz, is, doesn't have the most ethical character either. There's a few gaps in his character that the story demonstrates. And obviously the lady is like super evil. So there's, I mean, where is he going to get this guidance from? But it's, the, it's the, the initial part of Surah Yusuf, you know, demonstrates that this father did have direct engagement with the child and it 
had such long-lasting effects. So one of the lessons that we derive from Surah Yusuf, for instance, especially as parents, is that we cannot underestimate the value of early education. And not just, and I don't mean education as in memorize this surah, learn these du'as, know how to make wudu. That's what we've turned education into. Education for us is informative in nature. It is not transformative, you know. So in the, in the previous talk you heard repeatedly this idea of having our children internalize the deen. And so that's, that's something that we're going to talk about in a little bit, inshallah ta'ala. But that's the first you know, reality that I wanted to remind myself of. I do not control the guidance of my children. And you do not control the guidance of your children. As a matter of fact, we don't even have any control of the guidance of our own selves. So the fact that you're sitting here is you know, a blessing that we're sitting in a gathering of Muslims trying to learn something about the deen of Allah. But this is not because you had a super righteous upbringing. There are plenty of you sitting in the audience right now that are parents themselves that have made some pretty big mistakes in your lives. And if you look back, there wasn't like a set formula that ensured that you will receive guidance from Allah Azza wa Jal that you followed and that therefore you have guidance. It's actually a gift of Allah that all of us have to acknowledge came to us from Allah Azza wa Jal. But regardless of that, we have to make some efforts on our part. Now on the negative, I didn't get to mention on the negative. On the negative, you have the case of Nuh alayhi salam. In some sense, the father of all humanity. Because at one point, there's pretty much, you know, ذُرِّيَةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوح You're the offspring of whoever we boarded onto the ship with Nuh alayhi salam. And what a plan that was. All humanity would have died had it not been وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَى ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ we loaded him onto just planks and nails. Literally, Allah says, a thing made up of just planks and nails. In one place in the Quran, Allah doesn't even call it a boat or a ship, an ark. He just says boards and nails <laughs> for the greatest flood to ever hit humanity. And that's the reason we're, we're, we're breathing air today and we're, we're talking to each other today because of those boards and nails. That was Allah's plan, you know. But in any case, I talk about Nuh alayhi salam because... He's one of the greatest messengers that has ever lived. He has something unique in common with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that he was the messenger to all of humanity because there was no other humanity left. Our messenger was sent to all of humanity and he was basically the only messenger for humanity at the time. But you know what's remarkable about Nuh alayhi salam? Unlike our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of any of your men any of his male children did not live long enough on this earth to see the age to, they, were, they would become men, Nuh alayhi salam did in fact have a son. And what, an, what a great opportunity. Your father is a prophet. That's pretty awesome. And not just any prophet. Ulul min ulil azm min al rusul. Awwaluhum, actually, the first messenger of great resolve. The messengers of elite status, the five of them, he's the first of them, actually. He's the trailblazer blazer in, this, in this legacy. And yet, if you study his legacy, the first thing that hits you and hits you really hard is the fact that he couldn't get through to his wife and he couldn't get through to his son. Who is he going to go ask Allah, who, other than Allah, Ya Allah, what can I do to, for my son to listen to me? You know when parents come and ask, what can, I, what, can you give me something that if you just say that, then my son will transform? Or my daughter, if you just... Or, and the, the most awkward one of all, they drag this teenage kid. Hey, 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 we, he watches a lot of your YouTube videos and he's like. <laughs> just, just say something to him. Okay, sorry, <laughs> bro. <laughs> you know, I can't, you know, Nuh alayhi salam couldn't get through to who? His own son. You know, Yusuf alayhi salam is awesome and he was a beneficiary of the advice of his father. But wait a second, Yaqub alayhi salam had other kids too. They were not just beneficiaries for a little while, they remained beneficiaries of their father's advice for many, many years. And yet, until the very end of their lives, way down the road, did they, or the entire story, did they actually turn around and make tawbah. So, it's not in our hands. And we have to accept that. We, have to, we like things to be in our control. We like things to go exactly as we want. And so long as you have that, you yourself and I myself haven't internalized one of the most fundamental truths of life on this earth. We are ibad. We are slaves. We have a master. The master is in control. We are not in control. 
We are not in control. Now that we accept that, then Allah will give us advice on how we can earn His favor. Because guidance from Him is a favor. And you, you have to work hard to earn that favor. And you have to provide your children an opportunity so Allah can favor them as well. You do your best. You, knowing full well, you cannot ensure anything. If our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam turns to his daughter, he turns to his daughter and says, Ya Fatima tu bintu Muhammad ittaqillah fa inni la amliku laki min Allahi shay'an. Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, you need to have your own taqwa of Allah. You need to be cautious and aware of Allah because I will have no authority against Allah with, with, if, when I stand before Allah in your favor. I won't be able to help you. If the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa whose shafa'a we are all hopeful for on Yawm al-Qiyamah is telling that to his own daughter. His own daughter. And we have to internalize that reality. Now I've taken too much time for that one comment, but I think it was important to set that foundation. The ayah that I really wanted to talk to you about today is an ayah from Surah Maryam, and a really scary ayah. In this ayah, and before this ayah, it's important to note, Allah mentions a number of prophets and messengers, and that is the style of the beautiful Surah Maryam. Allah Azza wa for instance, mentions Ismail alayhi salam and says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدُ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاءِ he mentions Ibrahim, Ismail alayhi salam, and he says something awesome. He says about him, you know, that he was a, a truthful prophet. But in addition to all of that, he used to tell his family to pray and give zakat. He used to command them to pray, tell them to pray, and do zakat. Which is pretty awesome. Because where, why uniquely singling out Ismail alayhi salam of all the other prophets and telling us about Ismail alayhi salam that he used to tell his family to pray? I would imagine every prophet would tell their family to pray. Why Ismail alayhi salam? Because we are tying him directly to the legacy of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Rabbi j'alli muqi masalati wa min dhurriyati. And Allah is showing us that that sincere dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ya Allah, make me an establisher of prayer and also from within my offspring. Well, from within his offspring is who? Ismail alayhi salam. And he's fulfilling the, the, the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah has gifted that gift to Ismail alayhi salam. So he's furthering the importance of salah. Actually carrying the deen forward in this passage. You know what it is? Carrying salat forward. I'll repeat myself. Re passing on the religion in this passage is actually expressed in what? Passing down salat. Passing down salat. We think of salah as an oblig obligatory thing that is done five times. If you study the Quran carefully, you will find salat is actually the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When you study the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam and what he wanted people to be afterwards and how they would be protected, salat is an inescapable truth. It is actually the, 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 the central beam of our religion. It is the central pillar of our religion. Everything else revolves around it. If you don't have salah, you don't have anything. You don't have anything. As a matter of fact, when people, you know, when, when people are raised on judgment day, what do they say? How long did they live? Do you know? Illa bithna illa yawman. We only remained on this earth for one day. And what is one day made up of? Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaba mawkuta. Our day is simply going from one prayer to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So if all of life is reduced to a day, then a day is reduced to what? Prayer. Like in the, in the mind of a Muslim, there is no such thing actually as 10 a.m. or 12 p.m. or 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. It's right before Dhuhr and right after Maghrib and between Maghrib and Isha. Actually, we think of our entire life schedules around our prayer. We think of, we're, at least we're supposed to think of them around our prayers. Now, the value of prayer in this passage, Allah mentions different prophets and how they carried a legacy and from their genealogy, other prophets and from their genealogy, other prophets. But then going to an ayah of sajda, which is cool because the previous talk was about sajda. This is actually an ayah of sajda that I'm going to read on. I don't, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know, there's going to be so many people in the audience. If we read an ayah of sajda, we'll have to make sajda. I'm like, why are we getting... Lazy about sajda. وَهُمْ لَا يَسْأَمُونَ They don't get lazy. Allah says that Himself. So we shouldn't get, I shouldn't hesitate in sharing something with you from the Qur'an that's going to call us to do sajda. So some volunteer help me figure out which way the qibla is because we're going to do this. Okay. 
Anyway, anyway Those are the people that we favored or Allah, Allah showered favored upon. They, have, they belong within the legions of prophets. Adam, from the children, the legacy, the offspring of Adam alayhi salam. And whoever among them, among the ones we boarded on to the ship that is implied with Nuh alayhi salam, the ark. Ibrahim wa Israel. And from the children of Ibrahim and which prophet did I say? I didn't say Ismail, I said Israel. And the question arises, what happened to who? Israel is mentioned and Ismail is not mentioned, meaning the legacy from Ishaq is mentioned, but the legacy from Ismail is not mentioned. It's not mentioned because he was especially mentioned already. He was put in number one position. And now we're, this is, these are the next ayat. This is the beauty of Quran. It prioritizes things a certain way. This is where things get really remarkable. Now it's talking about us. So far the ayat, we're talking about prophets. Then he says, and out of the ones that we guided, and out of the ones that we chose, and the word for choice, ijtabayna, suggests that he chose based on something good he saw in you. So every single person who believes in Islam, who follows Millat Abina Ibrahim, who follows the legacy of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam, who accepts La ilaha illallah, is actually from within people Allah chose. They belong to people that Allah decided to give guidance to. The fact that you're Muslim has, from an Iman perspective, has nothing to do with who your parents are. Has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the fact that Allah chose you. And has everything to do with the fact that there is something in you that makes you special enough that you should be worthy of that choice. And that is the meaning of the word ijtabayna. Istifa is just a pure choice. You don't even know why it's made. It's purely from the one who made the choice. But ijtiba is done based on qualifications. Like when you hire someone, you find the right qualifications and hire them. Or when somebody gets accepted into a college, it's because they have the right kind of scores. They get accepted into the college. It's that, that's actually called ijtiba. That is called ijtiba. And Allah uses that word for the entire ummah. Throughout history, throughout all prophets, anybody who followed them, including ourselves, until the day of judgment, anybody who will accept Islam is actually a decision by Allah. It's a decision by Allah. Wajtabayna. Then he says about these people, what do they have in common? وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ الرَّحْمَانِ خَرُّوا سُجَّدًا وَبُكِيًّا Now we are tied to the legacy that began in this ayah with who? Adam alayhi salam. Think about this. From Adam alayhi salam to me and to you, what ties us together? When the ayat, when the revelations and the miracles of ar-Rahman are recited onto them, they fall into sajda and cry. This has been the, this is what's been passed down. Sajda has been passed down. Salat has been passed down. From all the way to the top. All the way to the bottom, this is an ayah of sajda. Somebody tell me which way qibla is, please. This way? We're going to make sajda. Now we're tied to the legacy of guidance, holding on to guidance with the legacy of Salah. And now the scary ayah. After them, after the people who held on to this legacy, much after them came another generation of, let me translate this in Urdu first, Nikameh. Khalf, useless people, losers, disappointments, people that are in the next generation, they're called khalaf. If there's any good in them, يعني يراد منها من خلف الأخيار ويراد من خلف بسكون اللام الأشرار. In, in, in the language, when you say khalaf, you're saying future generations that you're proud of. And when you say khalf, the sukoon, when you put a sukoon on it, then these are future generations that are a disappointment. What I call nikameh, useless. Allah says then after them, khalf came. You, a useless generation, a disappointing generation came. What makes them so disappointing? Listen to this. Allahu salata. They wasted the prayer. Allah is telling me and you, 
a nation, a generation has been wasted. They are no good. There's nothing coming from them. And what makes them no good? The first crime, the first tragedy of these people, they wasted the prayer. He did not say they left the prayer. He didn't say they were lazy in the prayer. They didn't say they forgot about the prayer. The language is very precise. He says they wasted the prayer. Now, how do you waste something? How do you waste money? You waste money in a number of ways. Or how do you waste an opportunity? You don't take advantage of it. You waste money if you put it somewhere where it doesn't bring you any benefit. You wasted the money. You had something good, you didn't do something good with it. You wasted your time. You could have done something so much better with your time. In other words, there's something there, but you're not using it the right way. That is also wasting it. So Allah is not necessarily talking about people who don't pray. He's not limiting the conversation to people who don't pray. He's talking about people who don't benefit from their prayer. They don't benefit. They wasted it. The prayer is supposed to transform me. It's supposed to transform you. It's supposed to change something in us. You, why is it supposed to change something in us? This is already, this is the remarkable eloquence of the Qur'an. In the previous ayah we learned, people heard the ayat of Ar-Rahman. And when they heard the ayat, what happened to them? What happened? They fell into sajda. Tell me what happens in your salah. You stand and you listen to the ayat of Ar-Rahman. And what are the next phase in salah? What's the next phase in every rak'ah, the final phase? You fall into sajda. In other words, what you physically do, you're supposed to experience emotionally as well. You're supposed to be so overwhelmed by the word of Allah that you just fall and before Allah. It's supposed to actually not only be a mechanical thing, it's supposed to be a natural consequence of experiencing the word of Allah. As a matter of fact, when you recite the ayat, you should want to go into sajda not because you ate too much or because you're tired, but because these ayat are so powerful that you can't even hold yourself up anymore. You can't even, your knees are wobbling because you just, you're overwhelmed by Allah and you just want to fall. When is sajda described in the Quran? When magicians see the power of Allah of a stick turning into a snake, regular people, they all think it's magic. The magician's got a snake, Musa's got a snake. But the magicians know their, their industry. So they know that's, that ain't no magic, that's for real. So what do they do? What happens to them? They fall into sajda. When people of the book come and visit the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, wondering, we've heard there's a prophet here. There is a prophet mentioned in our books. We want to see if you're a liar or not. They hear some Quran and what do they do? What does the Quran describe? They fall into sajda. They fall into sajda. The idea of sajda in the Quran is when people are overwhelmed. When the family of Yusuf alayhi salam is reunited, they see him and they're like, that's the same kid we threw in a well? They were so overwhelmed by the power of Allah to protect someone he decides. You know, and to keep them on guidance. That they fell into sajda. They just couldn't help themselves, but they fell into sajda. The idea of sajda is being overwhelmed. What are we learning? Why is sajda a part of our salah? Because you and I are supposed to be overwhelmed. But overwhelmed by what? The Qur'an. We're supposed to have this awe of the Qur'an when we hear it recited. It's supposed to shake us to the core. You know? Allah Azza wa Jal describes this in the Qur'an. In, you know, إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ إِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا When the ayat are recited, it just it increases them iman. Their hearts tremble. Their hearts are overwhelmed. Just by hearing the word of Allah. You know, I, and this is not the subject, but since we're over time anyway. You know something about jinns? I'm not going to tell you a jinn story, relax. I'll tell you something about jinns. Jinns travel a lot. They don't need a passport. Right? So they travel across cultures, they travel across galaxies, I mean they, they travel, you know. There are some, some places where they cannot go, authorized access only, where shihab and rasadan, you know, meteor showers are hit on them, whatever. But they go all over. So they are, you can imagine they're even multilingual. A group of jinn, you know, the jinn were stuck on the earth when the Prophet ﷺ was receiving the Qur'an. Did you know that? Jinn can travel in the sky, but when the Qur'an was coming down, the sky was locked down. They couldn't go. Every time they tried to go to their usual hangout spot next to Mars or something, they got shot down. You're like, where's all the security from? Angel security? Like never before. 
And they're not allowed to hang out where they normally hang out. So they're all stuck where? On the earth. You know? That's why in Surah Al-Jinn also, أَلَّنْ نُعْجِزَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ They didn't, they, لَمْ يَذْكُرُوا السَّمَاء They didn't say, we knew that nobody will overpower Allah on the earth. They never mentioned the sky. You know why? Because they can't go up there. They're stuck on the earth. So now they're hanging out in, on the earth. And they're traveling around, just hanging out. And a group of them passes by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reciting Qur'an. They're just passing by him reciting Qur'an. And they all stopped. And they just started listening. Jinns started listening. And because they're multilingual, they're actually even familiar with what they recite from the book of Musa alayhi salam. So they actually, you know what happened? Allah describes this scene, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفْرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا وَنْسِتُوا They're talking to each other, they're passing by. When they came in the presence of the Qur'an, Allah says, they said to each other, shut up, listen! Hey, hey listen to that! وَنْسِتُوا فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ When it was done, when it was all done, then they went, ran back to their nations, مُنذِرِين going to warn them, يَا قَوْمَنَا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا كِتَابًا أُنزِلَ مِن بَعْدِ مُوسَى We just heard a book that came down after Musa. They're, they're so amazed, they just heard it right now and they're overwhelmed. Jinns are overwhelmed. This book came to human beings first and foremost. Well, where's our reaction? When Allah says they wasted the prayer, Wallahi, if you think of the, if you think of the ayat about prayer and the true engagement of the believer with the Qur'an, with the word of Allah, it's actually in the prayer. It's actually in the prayer. Now I'm gonna you know, deviate subjects a little bit. I, this ayah, that's, that was the first crime by the way. Allah salah. They wasted the prayer. I'll tell you the second consequence in a second, but we need to build up to that a little bit. Let me tell you something. We are living in interesting times for many reasons. We are living in times of skepticism, right? So the idea of you know, uh, religion being an outdated pre-modern thing is very common now. It's, it's, the, it's the common atmosphere in high school. It's certainly the common atmosphere in the university setting. So it doesn't matter if you're going in the accounting field or you're going to go into medicine, if you're Pakistani, uh, or if you're going to go, you know, whatever field you're going to go into, you're going to take a couple of years of electives. Okay, and those electives the idea of them is to instill enough in you enough doubt, enough ideas, you know, from the point of view of anthropology to, you know, psychology to philosophy. You get into, exposed to enough ideas that are they're more than enough to sh shatter or at least, at the very least, rattle your foundations in your faith. They're there to mess you up. And especially if you go further in your studies, some, some students decide they're going to go further in their studies in the humanities. So they're going to study, you know, uh, sociology of religion or anthropology or something like that. May Allah protect them because most of the people who end up in these fields become highly agnostic or highly skeptic of religion. You know, because they look at it, because, you know, in the academia, they study religion like, much like they're studying a corpse. It's something dead and they're doing an autopsy. It's a soulless study of religion. They call it Islamic studies programs in many universities. It's anything but, you know. It's this, it's this idea of just studying this thing that's very, it, their, their approach to it is no different from the department next door that's studying cadavers. It's honest to God. That's, it's, it is what it is. That, that is how it is. Now we're in that environment and we're in that culture and those ideas are not only relegated to academia anymore, they have made their way into YouTube. They have made their way into popular media, right? So we're exposed to that line of thinking overwhelmingly, all the time. I want to summarize the problem of modern thought in four, four ways. I think this is important for this conversation, especially when we're talking about giving faith to our children and passing the legacy of faith and prayer down to our kids then I think this is important. Uh, and if you've heard this from me before, I apologize. Actually, no, I don't apologize. Uh, you need to hear it again. So, uh, so here goes. In, in pre-modern society, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not, pre-modern society uh, put God at the center. So whether it was Hindu society, or it was Christian society, or Jewish society, pre-modern societies put some higher power at the center. Okay? And people who understood that higher power or studied that higher power or worshipped that higher power were the most important people in that society. So in, in Hindu society, the people who were the most re the religious you know, uh, uh, pundits or whatever they are, they were actually of the, the elite of that society. In Islamic tradition, the ulama were the elite of the society. They were the most noble, most respected of the people. 
in, in the Catholic tradition or in the Christian tradition, the people that studied Catholicism, they were actually very noble, they were the noble class of people, right? So the, the study of God was the most important study. The second most important study, I'm going to go in order now, three things at least. The second most important study was actually the study or the, the a focus on an afterlife. And it's not limited to Islam. Everybody talked about either, whether they talk about karma, or they talk about heaven and hell, or they talk about something. But there's a constant emphasis on an afterlife. Do we have that emphasis in Islam? Absolutely. Every, everything you do, there are consequences and benefits of it in the akhirah. So there was a focus on God, and there was a focus on the afterlife. And then thirdly, after God and the afterlife, there was a focus on bettering yourself morally, bettering yourself spiritually, saving your soul, I like to call it. Every culture has something about saving your soul. The Christians talk about saving the soul, you know. The, the Buddhists talk about it in one way, in, one, in so many words. The Muslims, we talk about tazkiyatun nafs, cleansing the self, the diseases of the heart, right? So there's an emphasis on, there's a part of me that is inside, that isn't my physical being, there's a spiritual entity inside me, and it needs to be taken care of. So what were the three areas of emphasis thus far? God, what else? Afterlife and you can just say the soul God the afterlife and the soul and then finally as a result of all of these actually I'll hold off to finally let me tell you what happened in postmodern society postmodern society the, the revolution in Europe basically leads to many many different kinds of philosophies because philosophy was outlawed in Europe but after the revolution against the church there was an explosion of philosophies in Europe and there were so many different so many isms right all, diff all different kinds of isms, but at the end of the day, all of those isms had a few things in common. And I want to share those with you. They said that we've been studying God throughout history. What has that given us? An oppressive regime? What does that produce? Has that produced a better world? But even now that we have an opportunity to explore the universe, understand matter, develop physics and chemistry, you know, understand mechanics, when we study these things, we see immediate benefits. You know the industrial revolution in Europe? It's not because people studied God, but it's actually because people studied the universe. So we've been studying God a long time, but nothing really happened. But when we study the universe, what happens? Great development. You see fantastic results. So you know what? Whether you want to believe in God or not, it's okay. But the real important thing is to study the universe. So there's a shift in focus. Now the emphasis is on studying the material sciences. And that, that shift that started with the European Revolution is so powerful that you, when you decide to study something that is immaterial, for example, if you decide to leave architecture and go into doing a major in history, your parents will say, what are you doing? You have to get a real job. And most, the most prestigious jobs today, the most prestigious positions today are people that hold positions in a particular science. Is it true or not? So there's a shift, cultural shift, and this is, is this a shift only in Europe and America? No, it's a global phenomenon. So there's this overwhelming emphasis on science, on the universe. What was the second thing that pre-modern society used to emphasize? The afterlife. We've been thinking about heaven and hell, what has that done for us? Well, you know, we need, to make, we need to figure out how to make this life and this society and this world and this city and this country better. We need to advance our study of urban development and architecture and sociology and political science and even psychology. Let's make this life better. And when they emphasize this, were they able to develop? Was Western civilization able to develop more amenities, more advanced political structures? more advanced infrastructure than humanity has ever seen? Absolutely. The study of science, we are beneficiaries of it. The fact that I'm using this microphone and there are cameras recording us and you can watch this on YouTube, this is because of the, the emphasis on scientific discovery. The fact that we took highways here, you know, the, the, the kind of infrastructure, people come from Pakistan, <laughs> you know, why do people love coming here? Why do people love going to Europe? Especially when they come from the Muslim world. Because in the Muslim world, the way we used to park our, our cows and our camels back in the day is still how we park our cars. <laughs> you know. And just like the camel moves around later, they don't even put the brake on. It's all, it's all good. You know. But we are, we, the world was mesmerized by the infrastructure developed by the West. Absolutely mesmerized. 
Now that's the second shift. Instead of focusing on the next life, let's focus on this life. What was the third emphasis that used to be there? The soul. Who needs the soul? What has the soul gotten us? Let's study the body. Let's study medicine. Let's study physiology. Let's study neurology. Let's study the, you know, the material part of the human body. It's such a universe in and of itself. It's fascinating. Let's make discoveries and breakthroughs in medicine and in the fields of you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 surgery and research in this, in, this phenom- in this area. And forget spirituality. Let's replace spirituality with psychology. And if you're having a problem, there must be some kind of chemical imbalance. We can fix that for you. Take this pill and you will not want to kill your cousin. You know? So let's... So what happened? A world that used to be emphasized on spiritual truths. God, the afterlife, and the soul now started emphasizing the universe instead of God, this life instead of the next life. If somebody says, why are you going to study Islam? Well, because I want to... I, I think it's good for my next life. <laughs> Get a job. Go study something that'll help you get a job now. And somebody says, why are, you, why are you making wudu? Well, you know, it's a means of purification. Praying is, it purifies us. You know, in al hasanat you have say, yeah, we can purify. Just use soap. You're pure. People started thinking of themselves and the life around them only in material terms. Now, let me tell you the last part. This is the reason I brought this up. These, this dichotomy of three versus three. I brought this up. Thank you. That was pretty cool. Okay, so this dichotomy, I tell you why I brought it up. Before, pre-modern society, a society based on faith, you have a set of values, and those values are revealed by Allah. They're revealed by a higher power. Therefore, they are not subject to change because they're timeless. And if you live by these values, then you will make God happy, then you will better your afterlife and you will be able to keep your soul pure. How will you do those three things? By abiding by what He revealed. But when the emphasis shifted, when the emphasis shifted, there was no longer a need for God's law or God's advice because the things that you will get as a result of following His advice are no longer emphasized. So morality itself became relative. What is good to you, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Is the moral compass of the United States, and by extension the world, is the moral compass of the world constantly shifting? What was wrong 30 years ago is okay now. What is wrong today might be okay in five years. The conversation about marijuana went super fast. That went way too fast. The conversation about homosexuality, study it over the last 30 years. Don't even talk about the Islamic perspective. Talk about the American view on homosexuality in the last 30 years. And what do you find? It's remarkable the pace at which the transformation has happened. From its introduction into media to the point where it's celebrated by the President of the United States is pretty remarkable. It's pretty amazing how quickly that happened. Now, Because we don't need a constant morality, we need something that is what? Relative. As society changes, we should change alongside with it. What did Salah do? Salah, by the way, we call it Iqamatul Salah, yes? Iqama means when you stand. And when you stand, you don't lean. The values in society have iwaj. This book is qayyim because it, it, it makes you qayyim. It stands up straight. Its values don't budge. Its values don't move. Now that Allah gave us these values, this Qur'an, look at what happens. They wasted the prayer. They let go of the prayer. When you let go of the prayer, the entire moral world view that comes with the prayer is also gone. When you waste the prayer, that's what that means. So what's the next part? وَاتَّبَعُوا shahawat. They followed desires. (laughs) What have I just summarized to you? What, what, what world are we living in now? The consumer world that we live in now, where the ultimate good is what? Following, obeying your thirst. Just do it. Sound familiar? You know? If it feels right, it must be right. As a matter of fact, in the world of counseling, in the United States, in many, many states now, counselors are not allowed to receive their certifications if 
they're counseling a young person who comes and says, I have certain thoughts, certain sexual deviations in my mind. I, I have these tendencies. I feel bad about them. You're not allowed to say, yeah, you're right. Those are not good feelings you have. You're supposed to say, if it feels right, you should go for it. You can't get your license in counseling if you don't agree. And that's increasing. We're officially becoming a nation of what taba'u shahawat. Follow what the, what the desires, what the shahwa is. Follow desires. You know, recently in Times Square, there was a, you know, Times Square has those giant billboards and the, you know, the, I, I, call, I keep calling it Megatron. It's some bigger, big, not the robot, the big screen, you know. In terms of advertising, they actually advertised a pornography website on Times Square. And the pornography industry, which is one of the most powerful industries in the world, and internet marketers that make millions a month, the vast majority of them are in the pornography industry. Now their next move is, well, if we're going to further this market, we're already making bunches of money, you know, spreading pornography online, but we can further this by making it normal. If we can make it acceptable, and it can, we can put an ad of it next to a Coke, or next to like a McDonald's french fries, it's just a normal thing, it's okay. That's the next step. There are non-Muslim movements right now, fight the new addiction. They're seeing it as a problem, but they're only gonna see it as a problem for a little bit. It's coming, it's coming. And in many of your offices, and in many of your universities, and in many of your public high schools, when a child or a coworker has some pornography on their phone, or on their tablet, or even on their screen, nobody cares, it's not a big deal. Or the way they talk, it's not a big deal. It's not a big, what taba'u shahawat? What, where, where, what was the first downfall? Salat. What taba'u shahawat? And then the final and the worst downfall, fasawfa yalqawna ghayya, then they will fall into deviation. And ghay literally means a, a curve or a deviation, which means their values will deviate, and they will deviate more, and they will deviate more, and they will deviate more, until finally the ultimate ghay, the ultimate deviation is when they fall into Jahannam. That's why the tafsir of this ayah, they say, Amtarat is sama'u nabatan. The sky rained vegetation. The sky does not rain vegetation. The sky rains water, which leads to vegetation. The, he, here it says, they follow deviation. They follow, by the way, al ghay I know I'm over my time, but that's okay. Inshallah. They'll forgive me. Inshallah. I'm only going to take like two more minutes. I promise. The first meaning of ghay, al dalal wal khayba. Listen to this. The first meaning of ghay is misguidance. So they're misguided, there's no standard for guidance anymore. And second of all, it is disappointment. So they will follow something and it will not give them pleasure. So they'll follow something else and it won't give them pleasure. And they will constantly be disappointed. Suicide rates will go up. People will live miserable lives. Depression will go up. Anxiety will go up. People will have fancy cars, nice clothes. People will have all these things, but they will not be happy. They'll be miserable. They'll be on antidepressants or they will take loads and loads of drugs because they don't want to face reality because they're too disappointed. They're in ghay. Then al ghay means al fasad, corruption. Things will get, they're thinking this will make the world a better place. It will become more enjoyable. But the world will become actually only on the surface more enjoyable. The reality of it will be a kind of ugly corruption you can't even imagine. So you will go to places where there are beautiful malls. And there's, you know, the lighting and the design. And you're just going to be like amazed. But the people who work there and work minimum wages are going to be living in subhuman housing. You know, it's going to be facade. It looks pretty. It looks pretty. They're going to sell these clothes in the malls at 200, 300, 2,000 percent profit that are going to be made in factories where people are working like slaves. Even animals shouldn't be treated that way. And if somebody decides to do an investigation on them, well and good. But don't do too much of an investigation because you'll lose, lose your job in Fox or CNN. Facade will come. Corruption will come. Because there's no guidance to keep humanity in check, to keep its greed in check. And the final meaning of ghay is tarqun nahi, as Sha'arawi rahimahullah argued. He said, ghay also means the abandonment of prohibition. In other words, there is no such thing as wrong. There is no such thing. It's not, it's, nothing's wrong. When it comes to the bottom line, everything's okay. The, 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 the corporate, soulless corporate industry, Watch these documentaries yourself. Don't listen to me. Watch these. They're not made by Muslim fanatics. You know, they're not made by right-wingers. <laughs> you know, they're made by people. Study what happened in the, the Gulf oil spill. Study what happened there. You know, they, there are no prohibitions for them. So long as we can make money, we don't care if we put people's lives in danger. 
We don't care if we pollute the entire oceans. We don't care. This happens when a useless generation comes up who didn't make prayer. My final comment. Why did I share this dark picture with you? This seems a pretty depressing talk. But, you know, there's another ayah. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا With the exception of those who repented, who, who revived their faith, and the one who did good deeds, who, who acted righteously. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا They're going to be entering Jannah. They will not be, they will not be, no wrong will be done to them in the least bit. What does Allah do at the end of this ayah? A useless generation came, but even within them, there will be people who can make tawbah. They can fix things. They can go back to how things are supposed to be. So if we, us and our children, are in the danger of falling into khalf, we can become khalaf. We can become khalaf. We, we have to fix this. We have to understand the urgency of the matter today. Communicate with your children. Be in open conversation with your children. Be cognizant and not afraid, not overwhelmed by the evil outside. Learn to raise the kids so they can stand up to that evil. And do the right thing. Stay, they're the, only, the only hope left for humanity is people who stand up for the, for the word of Allah. The word of Allah did not come to sit in a university or be downloaded on a website. The word of Allah is supposed to live in people's hearts and is communicated to other, other people's hearts. That's the generation we want to raise. And that's the hope that we have, inshallah ta'ala, with institutions like IOK, with efforts that are being made all over. And people can, we can raise people's like, moral compass so that they can go into the executive boardrooms of Shell and IBM or whatever else. IBM's gone, no, who cares about IBM anymore? You know, or Apple. There needs to be moral people in these places. Where, where are you going to get moral people from? Right here, in this hall. Right here. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to rise to the occasion. And may Allah not make us of those who are a disappointing next generation. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.